Let me be very clear. Never in history have there been so many heads of state and government under one roof in one day brought together for one topic for one challenge. That was the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change speaking in Paris. Some are framing the talks as the last chance to save the planet. Negotiations are underway to come up with an agreement to lower greenhouse gas emissions and limit global warming. But getting a deal that works for everyone is a tall order. Agreeing to mandatory emission cuts, many say are needed, seems unlikely because the U.S. isn't on board. Nor is there agreement on how soon countries should implement emission reductions. It also looks like there won't be any way to enforce whatever agreement may be struck because there won't be any legal mechanisms like trade sanctions to slap on countries that fail to live up to commitments. And there's disagreement over who should pay for climate change costs. Developing countries want wealthy nations to help. Justin Trudeau recently announced Canada would contribute more than two and a half billion dollars, but there's still a long way to go. Time now for the big picture. Bill Robson is president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. Goldie Hyder is president and CEO of Hill & Knowlton Strategies. And Armin Yelnesian is senior economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. So lots to talk about here. Uh, but let's start with where Justin Trudeau started when he arrived and made his presentation to the, the climate conference. He had this line that got picked up everywhere, Canada is back. And Goldie, I wanted to ask you, uh, start us off and, and tell us, you know, what is Canada actually back with at this point? <laughs> well, that's a very good question, but I think the Prime Minister has, uh, has, you know, not only in that statement making a statement, but if you look at what his other ministers have been doing, uh, climate change has largely been on the, on the minds of our foreign affairs minister and, and Mr. Dion. Uh, the, the prime minister himself held a premier's meeting in which they, they talked about largely climate change. Uh, we've got a big fundraising announcement that just took place here, about a $2.5 billion to give to other countries, which was not even in their spending commitments in their platform, I don't believe, so it's interesting how they're going to put that in the budget. It's clearly a part of their indigenous agenda, so it's quite evident here that this is the big bet of this government. This is the significant play that they're trying to make. And I think, as your opening indicated here, it's going to be a really, really difficult thing to navigate politically and, and policy-wise. Yeah, and I mean, when you consider that, you know, Canada is just a small part of what everybody else is doing. Uh, what are your thoughts when you look at what's going on with this Paris conference? Well, I found it interesting that, you know, they announced the 2.65 billion for poorer nations that are struggling with the costs of climate change, which includes massive displacement in some cases of their populations. But Canada is in the top 10 emitters of carbon in the world, and we're in the top five emitters per capita. And so the question is, how much money are we going to spend to turn that game around? We really need to start talking about our own mandatory targets because this 2%, uh, sorry, 2 degree temperature rise is nothing to be fiddled with. No. We, we have got a rendezvous with desertification of farmlands and all sorts of other terrible things. We're talking about, you know, Syrian refugees coming over. We're looking at hundreds of millions of people being displaced from their homes because of a combination of political upheaval and climate change. We've got to start acting fast, and we're part of the reason this is happening globally. Yeah, now you use the word mandatory. What are your thoughts about that, Bill? I am <clears throat> looking at this and wondering if the governments actually believe all their own hype mm -hmm. on this issue. Uh, and it's hard to conclude that they do, because if you were really serious about tackling this issue, you would go after consumption. So following on what Armin just said, Canada is a big emitter of greenhouse gases, and it's not because that we it's not because we produce the fuels, it's because we use them. It's happening in internal combustion engines coming out of tailpipes, it's happening as we heat our homes and our buildings. Um, and if you want to curb that, you have to tax it, really. So but, but that that's, is happening here, right? I well, mean, it's happening these... in British Columbia, uh, but I'm not seeing that kind of consensus in favor of getting a price on fuels that would take them out of use at the rate that would be necessary, let alone at the rate that would be necessary to do what Armin's talking about. So I don't think it's that serious. Uh, if you want some comfort from the fact that the countries are all talking and they've chosen a format that's going to avoid it just breaking down and people walking away acrimoniously, 
that's okay, but they're not talking about the thing they really need to do, and that's tax consumption. Well, uh, but Alberta's climate plan has that in it as well. That was one of the criticisms. They were saying it's too hard on consumers, and of course industry was saying, well, that's because it's all about consumption. What do you think, Goldie? Are, are we starting to go down the right road with some of these policies? Maybe. Uh, you know, I haven't heard the policies itself. I've heard all the problems, and I've heard in, in, in big picture terms what the solutions might look like. But we don't know who, as, as your introduction said, we don't know who's going to play. We don't know who's going to pay. We don't know whether the government is actually going to be able to execute some of these policies inside Canada, let alone outside Canada, because provinces, of course, have, a, have their own approach to, the, to this issue. Um, and I think this is the, the, the sort of the main point, if you will, as you know, if I can quote the great philosopher Kermit the Frog, being green isn't easy, <laughs> right? And and I think they're all going to learn that it's not easy to do this, and that's, that means that they have to uh, have some leadership in terms of how to manage this. So Jeffrey Simpson wrote a great piece about how the challenge here is the demand for energy continues to rise, but, but at the same time, so too does the carbon, and, and how do you bring that down? Renewables is, is a wonderful thing to say, but it, it's a long ways away from where we need to be to have reliable energy. Okay, but we just heard all of this, what we don't have, what we don't know, where it's not going, what we're doing wrong. Uh, but just the fact that everyone is together, we heard that clip right off the top of mm -hmm. this about this, the first time this number of leaders have been here. And it does definitely seem as if there is some coalescing around how important it is, as, as you were saying, Armin. Uh, are you encouraged by what you're seeing? Well, the only thing that doesn't make me want to kill myself at the lack of actionables that came out of uh, this whole uh, fufara is the fact that people aren't laughing about it anymore, which they were not very long ago. You know, the whole idea that we need to reduce emissions. And, you know, the, the climate science scientists are telling us we need to reduce uh, we need to get to peak emissions in five years and start turning them around in 10 to be able to meet this two degree warming. That's really not on the agenda anyway. The type of things that Bill's talking about, you'd have to have a carbon tax that is huge to get us to start reducing our consumption. But the irony of all ironies is the market is doing stuff that we don't seem to be willing to do for ourselves. What for example, mean? Statistics Canada announced that uh, investment in further oil sands uh, development had dropped by 35% year over year. So there is not only a kind of moral suasion argument and this growing awareness that we have to do something, the markets aren't letting us invest in the stuff that's going to make it worse. So that's really an interesting collision of forces that is uh, helping us take a look at can we pivot? Not only can we reduce our energy uses, but pivot our sources of energy to more renewable sources and kind of take the conversation from energy east to j energy least. Energy least. So what I would say, and it goes back to the Alberta thing, which a lot of that was about shutting down certain types of production, getting rid of coal-fired electricity, for right. example. Yes. Um, if you want to cut emissions, you asked what could we do, we could, and the feds could do this, they could raise the fuel tax. Very straightforward, it hits a lot of the biggest problem that otherwise doesn't get touched, because I mentioned motor vehicles, right? If you're serious about cutting greenhouse gas emissions, if you're serious about reducing CO2, the automotive sector is, I think, about 40% of it in Canada. So you're never going to get any way if you, anywhere if you don't tackle that. Uh, the but problem that has a with, lot of political price on that, right? Well, of course, if you're serious, you're going to pay a price because we have to actually reduce our consumption. It's not enough to shut an oil well somewhere or an oil sands mine somewhere. You actually have to cut down on the right. consumption. So the, here's the awkward part because our means right about what the market's doing on the supply side, but on the demand side, uh, fuel's cheaper now. And when it was expensive, consumption was going down. Now that it's cheaper, it's going to go up again. Yeah, it's sure. the ideal time to put the tax on one right quick on. point. And then I'll let Goldie in. We'll know that the world is serious when the big oil producers that subsidize consumption of gasoline inside their own countries, Saudi Arabia, stand to attention when they do something about that. Because they're actually encouraging the burning of carbon dioxide emitting fuels uh, with their subsidies. And we're not doing that, at least. We could tax it more, but they're actually but, but subsidizing know, it. Some suggest, Bill, though, that you know the Saudi game here in keeping oil prices low is actually about delaying and deferring the renewable <laughs> surge that they're scared of right now. Mm -hmm. And the, and that suggests to me that this oil price is going to continue to stay low for several years to come, maybe longer. Uh, and in the meantime, the consumer is to some extent being on both sides of this fence. You know, I, I, I support the policy on climate change. Oh, but by the way, I need an SUV, right? Because it's cheaper now to have the gas. So we are not doing a very good job in, in educating and communicating. And I think that goes back to my 
my, uh, my leadership point, which I think is sorely lacking on this issue, to actually get people to realize, which by the way, industry now appears to be on board to say, let's do things, and now we actually need to do things, including, how come nuclear is not an option in, on this agenda here? Why is it that one of the cleanest forms of energy, nuclear, no one's discussing in this country anywhere? Hmm. Well, they've got till December 11th in Paris. It's not over yet. <laughs> the negotiations continue, and uh, we'll be checking in with you in the future, I'm sure, to see just what came out of all of it. Thank you all Thank for being you. here.